Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Rob Lively, and this is Telling Tales, Western Maine's Story Place. We broadcast from the studio of Mount Blue Community Access Television on the campus of the University of Maine at Farmington in Farmington, Maine. We very much appreciate the help of Community Access TV here at Mount Blue, and we very much appreciate your help, your, your good work, and your support for the program. So thank you very much. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Rob Lively, and this is Telling Tales, Western Maine Story Place, where we feature outstanding tellers from our region and from our state. Over the months, we have featured many types of tellers, those that told personal stories, family histories, um, fairy tales, that sort of thing. We also kind of branched out, and we've talked with the geologist as a storyteller, or the musician as a storyteller, or the mime, or the, the poet. Today, along in those same veins, we're very pleased to have with us Teresa Secord, the internationally known basket maker. So, Teresa, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. And looking at your resume, with a bachelor's and a master's in geology, I, I'm wondering, and you practiced as a geologist, what's, what's the journey from geology to basket making? How, how did that happen? Well, it's, it's an interesting story in that um, I was in graduate school working on my master's degree and, and left there to go right to work for Mobile Oil Corporation in California. And I really did think I was going to have a career um, with mobile and in geology. But right around the same time, the early 1980s, the Penobscot Nation, of which I'm a member of that tribe, had mm -hmm. together with the Passamaquoddy tribe gained um, 300,000 acres of land back. And so um, the tribe at that time, right after the Maine Indian land claims, called up all their lawyers, foresters. I was the only geologist and everybody working in land use, people with degrees to come back and work for the tribe. So mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. Very good. So how did the basket making kind of evolve into that? Well, um, I did work for the tribe on this mineral assessment program for about a dozen years. And all the while, um, I had, on, on the reservation, I, I was living and, and working there. All the while, I was becoming really interested in the ash and sweetgrass basket tree that um, my, my great-grandmother had practiced and many of the elders on Indian Island near Old Town, Maine. And what I came to realize um, was that there were very few in my age group who were interested in learning. And I met my teacher, who um, Madeline Tomerche, who sadly would later become known as one of the last um, people who was uh, born learning the Penobscot language um, fluently, that um, she was also a great basket maker, and I started work with her mm -hmm. through the language classes and basketry. And so I soon became really distracted by the basketry that was all around me, but yet fast disappearing. So you mentioned your great grandmother. How do, how do how do the, how does your basket making uh, display stories or tell stories? Well, um, I knew my great grandmother as as a girl. I visited the reservation quite a bit, especially in summers. I'm from a family of six, the only girl. So my grandparents were living on the reservation, as was my great-grandmother and a number of aunts and uncles and cousins. And so when I would go to visit, I would see, you know, the baskets being made and, um, you know, understood what an important part of the culture it was. And my great-grandmother at that time in the 1960s and 70s was really earning a living through her basketry. Mm. And um, it wasn't until later, though, when she passed away and I was around 20, that I really became interested. And, um, you know, sadly, by then she was gone. But when I started learning from 
um, Madeline Shea, when I was living and working on the reservation, she told me a lot of stories about the basket tree and particularly about my great grandmother and how um, proud she was of her heritage and how she basically, and I had heard this through the family too, basically had fed a family of 10 on basket tree income. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think is interesting is um, the, the women entrepreneurs, if you will, in this generation were really active in the basketry as artists and as, as selling their baskets along the coast of Maine and different resorts and even on Indian Island there were like a basket shop in nearly every home. And her husband, uh, my great grandfather, who was also a tribal chief, he was among that generation who was expected to go to work in the shoe shop and in the canoe factory, Old Town Canoe, the Old Town Paper Mill. And I think he really bucked that, you know. And I remember growing up hearing a lot of stories about perhaps that he shirked his duties, you know, as head of the family and as a father. But at the same time, I thought, you know, um, he was also a, a guide, um, as were many men in, you know, from from Indian Island, they're particularly guiding around the Penobscot River, but also Moosehead Lake region. And so working hard in that tradition. And the women would go to these resorts as well, and Kineo, and sell the baskets. And so I think there was, you know, quite a relationship there with the economy, you know, Maine's tourist economy. But one thing I thought was interesting about my great grandfather is that even if he could get a job in the shoe shop or the paper mill, this was not the historic trajectory, you know, for men in the tribe who mm. were used to hunting and fishing and providing for their family in that way. And so mm. I think as we look back historically during this bicentennial time, the last 200 years, we realize how resilient the Native people were by, you know, kind of really changing their lifestyle and changing you know, with the economy and with the times by having this enormous land loss mm. and um, being able to adapt quite, quite, um, quite well, I think. Mm -hmm. In spite of it all, you know, being confined to the small islands in the Penobscot River. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was really proud to go to work for my tribe and be a part of the resurgence of that, you know, claiming the land back and the use and also, you know, working with people to help reclaim language, but particularly the basketry and the culture. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, what, what do we have here? What can you tell us about? Well, so these? my, my <coughs> baskets um, are, are woven of ash and sweet grass. And as you can see from the photo of my great grandmother, they very much reflect her style. Um, this is a historic photo of my great grandmother, Philemon Solace Nelson selling around 1953 um, on Indian Island in Maine. And um, I would love to have a table full of <laughs> baskets like she has there, but it's, it's a lot of hard work to get um, the wood from a tree in the deep Maine woods into a basket like this. And so um, I've been a basket maker for more than half my life now. And... Um, these baskets, although they reflect, you know, her style, I use all the same wooden tools and forms. And a lot of my weaves um, are very similar to the family weaves that have been handed down to me. I also do my own adaptations, like the, the woven corn there is, is all made of ash, which is, um, mm. you know, really quite a, quite a lot of work. It's, I say mostly in the basket making too, and this was what I was taught when I learned to weave the baskets is, you'll spend more time preparing the materials for weaving than actu the actual weaving. Um, the grass in that sweet grass, those two sweet grass boxes was braided. And um, you know, of course, at first it had to be picked at the coast of Maine, harvested, dried, and then braided into long like ropes on the backs of chairs to weave into the basket. So I, I still use tools that date back to the 1800s in my family, having mm -hmm. been handed down not just from my grandmother, but from my great grandmother, but from her father mm -hmm. as well. So in terms of supplying, like the sweet grass and so forth, do you do you literally go out into the woods and do that or do you have a supplier? Um, you know, I used to um, mm. do harvest sweet grass and um, but I, I've, I've 
confess I've never cut down an ash tree and hand, mm -hmm. hand pounded the log um, to release the splints. But um, now I, I purchase from other tribal members, people who um, may be Micmac, Maliseet, Penobscot, or Passamaquoddy. And what's interesting is that this is very much um, a community art form. Um, the, by the time I receive the wood that I'll then further split and gauge, you know, terms I'm sure you're not familiar with, but processing the wood down to the point where we could literally sew, sew with it. I mean, along the edges of the corn basket, we're basically sewing with wood. Um, but by the time I received that wood and have cut that down, maybe as many as three or four people have had a hand in that. The guy and his son or nephew who cuts down the wood, uh, the, the tree in the deep main woods, after hunting for it for probably um, a week or more, you mm -hmm. know, and then only 10% of the brown ash logs uh, trees are going to really produce the kind of high-end wood that we use as weavers. This is this is the sap wood, um, the wood that's on the outer part of the tree, as opposed to the heartwood, which for those who know what the ash log looks like, there's always a brown core mm -hmm. inside, mm -hmm. and that's used for the heavier work baskets, like the pack baskets that you see, you know, um, that hunting and, you know, my husband has a uh, pack basket for ice fishing, the hunting and fishing baskets that date back um, probably thousands of years made to fit in the bow of a birch bark canoe. Mm -hmm. So this is a very ancient art form and the forms that you see here are very much adapted to the large Victorian houses in um, the mid to late 1800s. Um, so back to the community art form, it's just, I've always found that fascinating. So after the tree is cut down and perhaps the nephew or the son or grandson will pound that log, you know, for several hours and almost a half a day or a day to release the splints along the growth rings, then um, it's, it's split further by that family or it's then processed and sold or traded to the basket makers. And there are specific people, particularly Passamaquoddies in our tribes, the four tribes here in Maine who will harvest the sweet grass and sell it by the pound to the other basket makers. And until very recently, there were ladies, uh, particularly again Passamaquoddy because they live closest to the coast where the sweet grass is harvested, mm. who would just braid the grass and sell the braided bundles to the basket makers, mm. um, you know, like a hundred yards worth. And so, um, again, I, I think it's really interesting because people have said, um, you know, wh why can't you do this art form in other places? And it's it's not an independent art form. You know, you can't just go and buy paint at a store and go be inspired somewhere. You have to be a part of this community and this economy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of the aspects I really like about our basketry. So in terms of continuity, I mean, here we're going way back to your great-grandmother mm -hmm. and even before that. Uh, coming up to the present day, you mentioned that you were among the younger. Mm -hmm. um, how does it look for the future for basket makers? Well, it's looking very good right now. Um, one of the things that I also worked on when I was learning basketry myself was um, the f help to found the main Indian Basket Makers Alliance. And at, like I said, at the time that I was learning in the late 1980s, there were probably only about, I'm guessing about a dozen of us statewide younger than the age of 50 um, beginner basket makers. And that, that's not a lot. It had been passed down continuously, you know, generation after generation in each of the four tribes. And um, those of us who founded the organization, of which there were about 55 people, um, we could see that the tradition would be gone in a generation or two. Mm. The basket makers were having a really hard time finding um, suitable ash trees. Um, they had been um, dying due to this dieback, then we worked on with the main forest service on it. Now they're under threat again with the emerald ash borer beetle, mm -hmm. that invasive pest. Um, mm -hmm. But um, and then young people re weren't really learning. You know, there wasn't a lot of incentive either because the basket prices were so low. So when we formed this organization, um, fast forward, we spent 20 years teaching a new generation of basket makers in all four tribes. 
and we had by the 20 year mark we realized we had managed to lower the average age of basket makers from 63 to 40 mm. and we had increased numbers from around 55 to um, somewhere between 150 and 175 mm. basket makers mm. and so I'm going to a large national Native American art market this week in Phoenix of which there'll be about 650 of us from dozens and dozens of tribes selling our art together and of the probably around 20, I think I counted only around 26 basket makers out of those um, 650 artists, um, fully 25% are from Maine, mm -hmm. the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. They'll be either mm -hmm. Passamaquoddy or Penobscot. Mm -hmm. So we're really proud of the work that we've done um, over the years and bringing forward this new generation in their 20s and 30s and mm -hmm. now, now in their 40s. So I think it's in safe hands, but again, the ash beetle will, will challenge them, yes. that next generation. Yes, yes. So you mentioned you're headed to Arizona tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you're very much part of a tradition that goes back, what, hundreds of years, you mentioned earlier, that uh, in of selling baskets at tourists and so forth. Right. So you're, you're part of that tradition and carrying it on. Right, yes, as you can see from my great-grandmother's photo, you know, it says Indian baskets for sale. I mean, um, for us, these are, these are commodities, too. And I think also a way of projecting our, you know, sovereignty as Native people through economic self-sufficiency. Mm. I guess, you know, to sum it up in one sentence, I think um, that's something I'm, I'm really proud of, being a part of that continuum. And um, in addition to going to Arizona, and the Santa Fe Indian Market, which is coming up in August, um, that's really the largest juried Native American annual art show in the world. Um, I, 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 I'm working on an exhibition um, with the Portland Museum of Art to open in 2021, and it, it has to do with this theme of women entrepreneurship um, in the basketry. And I think the oldest picture, historical picture I've seen of basket makers selling is around 1860 on mm. Mount Kineo. Mm. And again, um, in studying the basketry collection that I'm working on for the exhibition and the old photographs beginning around 1860, um, or was it 1850 to the present, so about 150 years of photographs, most of the um, basket makers selling baskets are women. And so I just thought that was really exciting and interesting and, a, and kind of a new theme for a basketry exhibition for the Bicentennial. Mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of explore some of the stories, um, you know, of these really strong women in our tribes and in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be men and women going to sell in this Indian market on the weekend. Um, mostly, I think we're both from the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribes. Mm -hmm. What is the ratio of females to males and here in Maine? Well, in the basketry, it's, it's, it's always been about half in terms mm. of the, um, you know, basketry. But, it, but the men historically have made the larger baskets for the hunting and fishing and, you know, that kind of sport tourism, I guess, you know, and realizing mm. that the women historically were making these smaller baskets, some of the ones here that I'm showing, were made for holding ladies' gloves or handkerchiefs or men's collar stays, that little round one, which, mm. which aren't being used anymore. Mm. And so traditionally the women were the ones who made those baskets and the men, um, as I said before, who also worked as guides in that hunting and fishing industry, mm -hmm. made the heavier you know, pack baskets and the other baskets for hunting and fishing. So can you say something? How long did it take you to make that? <laughs> I want to say it took about 32 years to make that. <laughs> because just a lot of the, um, you know, it requires so much um, um, experience, you know, to be able to even feel the wood and, and what kind of basket you're going to weave with it and, you know, to, to understand how the materials work together. Um, but that one, probably took about three weeks, you know, <laughs> frankly speaking. And I'm, I'm usually working on more than one at a time, too. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. Um, there are a group of us, and we all kind of try to fit together. 
Um, because you can imagine there's a bit of competition there with six of us selling, our, <laughs> or seven of us, I think, selling our baskets together on the weekend in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And so I think my style, you'll see a lot of braided sweetgrass and more historical forms. Some of the younger basket makers like Jeremy Frey, um, he's an internationally known star really, having won the best, um, best of show, the biggest prizes in, the, in that show twice and the Santa Fe Indian Market. Mm. Um, once in 90 years in, in that one and and you know his baskets are phenomenally beautiful like large um, contemporary forms and mm -hmm. so but again very much rooted in this tradition that he finds himself t in as well you know being mm -hmm. Passamaquoddy and hailing from the easternmost point in the continental United States I think he counts seven or eight generations mm -hmm. in his family mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's really a good time to mm -hmm. to be a basket maker, I'd say. Well, you yourself have won some national and international awards, haven't you? Do you want to tell us a bit about those? Well, you know, yeah. I, the one I'm the most proud of, I think, is the um, the National Heritage Fellowship Award in 2016, mm -hmm. um, bestowed um, upon me by the National Endowment for the Arts and. Um, very proud of my letter signed by um, President Obama, <laughs> but a lot to do with my work and encouraging a new generation of basket makers um, to come forward, you know, being the grant writer and running the apprenticeship programs, the workshops in the tribal communities. And, you know, of course, I didn't do it alone, but, you know, I was the director of the organization at that time. And we had a, a retail gallery and set up the annual markets in Maine that I think we're going to show a little calendar of at the end. And mm -hmm. so that's how people can support the tradition, too, to keep, um, you know, their interest going and come and collect baskets or just pay some compliments to the basket makers, <laughs> mm -hmm. which are kindly paying me here today. <laughs> Thank right, you. So. so so many of these are historical in terms of their original use. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's one of the things that happens whenever you use historical tools and so forth and historical models. So you're seeing an evolution of how they're used now though. So this used to be for gloves, is that right? Yes. That would be considered a, mm -hmm. a box for how ladies gloves and so I think what was interesting about that too is um, those baskets are, you know, in, in museums like the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, but also in the houses in Bar Harbor still will have people who um, have descended from the generations ago, you know, long ago, who bought the gl real glove boxes for mm -hmm. use. And they'll, they'll come to the market in Bar Harbor, for example, and buy one from a contemporary maker. And mm -hmm. so there's that historical memory in Maine, too, about, you know, the use of these baskets. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just as there is true with the, even the potato harvesting baskets, which mm -hmm. uh, almost becoming a thing of the past in terms of their actual use as well. Um, you know, and I have a pack basket that I, I wouldn't want to put ice fishing traps in anymore, <laughs> you know, doing more. I think it's in Bill's office right now, actually. And so, um, you know, they've become heirloom pieces of mm -hmm. art or, you know, contemporary art that people use to decorate with. I think one thing that's interesting, though, is... The historical memory is still in the coastal resort areas of Maine, you know, Booth Bay Harbor, Squirrel Island. There's a large collection of, of baskets and a lot of the cottages there, you know, mm -hmm. which are really large homes to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I travel quite a lot and fly in and out of the jet port, and I see these magazines, you know, Maine Home and Design and Maine Magazine, and so you look at these multi-million dollar homes along the southern coast of Maine now, and there are baskets from Pier 1 Imports in there, mm. <laughs> you know, probably mm. Ikea. And you just think, wow, do they not know about this incredible art form, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, that is uniquely Maine. I mean, this is Maine's oldest art form, bar none, you know, and so mm. I think... Um, that's continuously practiced today. Mm -hmm. And so I think we still have some educating to do. And that's why it's exciting to be working on exhibitions in Maine, too. There was just a really significant exhibition, including baskets, called Holding Up the Sky at the Maine Historical Society, which a lot of people saw, and one that 
I, also I was associated with as an advisor and a, a trustee, um, both that one and the um, We Winnie an exhibition at the Colby Art Museum. And that was, that was great um, to have baskets shown for the first time ever as art in a fine art museum. I mean, there had been a few included in the Portland Biennials at the Portland Museum of Art, mm -hmm. but as a standalone Native American art exhibition, that, that was the Wee Winnegan exhibition at Colby was the first one. <clears throat> and that was, you know, that wasn't in an ethnographic museum um, that was solely dedicated to fine art. And so there were um, co-curators and curators who were Native American on that as well. And so I think that's really exciting too in these times that um, it's been a long time, but finally um, Native American artists and anthropologists are being invited into museums to, to work really proactively mm -hmm. on um, projecting ourselves as artists and through our art and to show our art. And I guess the other thing I want to point out on the table is um, my great-grandmother's father-in-law's business card from the late 1800s, so showing mm -hmm. that that tradition has been in my family. Mm -hmm. um, at least, I guess, five or six generations. Because yeah. I'm teaching my son now, and uh, my sons and nieces have learned in my family. So was there a certain amount of a status, let's say, back in the Victorian era of, of buying such outstanding baskets? As you said, they become family heirlooms. Is that, was there that history or that tradition, do you think? Yeah, I, I really do think so. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I was invited to give a talk um, on Squirrel Island in Booth Bay Harbor, and there had been basket makers selling there for generations as one particular family, the Mitchell family. Um, I think 70 people came to this talk, mm -hmm. and they brought all these baskets from the houses to show mm -hmm. me, and mm -hmm. like they were, they were treasured possessions, and some of the people were my age and weren't even alive when the baskets were bought, of course. And so, but yet they had been handed down through generations in these families as treasured objects, you mm -hmm. know, of mm -hmm. the of the summer houses there. And so, so I do think there was that long historic understanding of the importance of of this art form and and the relationship too between, um, you know, the tribal people and the people appreciating their art and baskets, which, as I said, you know, continues today. I think the interesting thing, though, is that we, we do fly to Arizona and New Mexico really for the true appreciation where, you know, the, the prices that we gain there are extraordinary for our baskets compared to, um, you know, there, there is a market here in Maine and the summer market is very good and, you know, but the the people who really collect and appreciate Native American art are typically in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. So again, I was thinking of the continuity of, of you as a making your art and how it gets distributed. It used to be that that your forebears would go to the tourist areas here mm -hmm. in the state. Now you get on a plane and you fly into various places, literally all over the country. And uh, I guess that just shows the evolution of the art and, and the merchant, the kind of the merchandising of it. Yes, yes, and mm. you know, I think you know it, we've managed to um, you know have some good markets here in Maine. The mm -hmm. next one that's coming up is um, May. Um, I think it's 15 or 16 on you know a, the middle of May in Bar Harbor, and that will be. Um, that will be again kind of recreating this historic market mm -hmm. where people would come to Bar Harbor, you know, Native Americans. And actually in the olden days, people would encamp there for entire summers. Mm -hmm. And there have been books about that. Bunny McBride wrote a great book about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's called Indians in Eden because mm -hmm. Eden used to be the name of the town of Bar Harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very good book, a, a picture book really too of, um, you know, that encampment where people weren't just selling baskets, but also birch bark canoes and taking people for canoe rides. And they would stay there for the entire summer. And um, another interesting story is my teacher growing up at um, the Poland Spring House, because mm. her grandmother was there at another Indian encampment. And so we're talking about the the really early 1900s, probably around 1915 when she was five years old she was um, 
listed as um, being a favorite of President Harding's when he visited the Poland mm -hmm. Spring House. So the, the resort there had tribal people, you know, encamping there and plugging in to mm -hmm. that tourist economy. So, um, and again, we're doing that. We're just mm -hmm. going on planes to, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so. to do it. Well, this has been so much fun and so exciting. And, Thank you. and, and this is a whole new world, I'm sure, for many of our mm -hmm. viewers. And it, it's exciting that you have taken it to, and your colleagues have taken it to another level, so that it, it, it's the appreciation. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And, Pleasure. And thank you for watching uh, Telling Tales, Western Maine Story Place. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.